if I don't believe in God? Well, you don't have to answer that question. You know that Scripture is alive, and uh, it's more powerful than a two-edged sword, amen? And so you're going to go ahead and share Scripture with them anyway, no matter what they think about it, because it, you're, you're, you're doing it, and it's dividing asunder the joints and the marrow and the discerning of the thoughts and the intents of the heart, right? Whether they realize that or not. But you also want to use things that will logically appeal to them, that will help them, because what does it do? If in the natural mind they say, oh, so you're presenting some evidence, what do they do? They begin to let their guard down a little bit. Oh, well, that makes sense. Oh, well, I didn't know. Oh, okay. They begin to let their guard down a little bit. So now you're beginning to give some credence to who Christ is and to the Word of God. So now they become more open to it. Well, what's happened? That Word's working in them now, and they're beginning to hear it and receive it and accept it. Amen. And so that's good. Amen. Um, the fact of the matter is, is that reading is powerful and it's good. You're going to find that we live in a world that's educated now. Two. And reading won't hurt you anyway. <laughs> I, just read, uh, I just read the other day. I think it was posted on Facebook. Or uh, maybe I read it in one of my, one of my uh, study books. But anyway, I read it somewhere that uh, if you can get a child to read 20 minutes a day, he'll be an A student throughout school. If you can get a child to read five minutes a day, he'll be a B student throughout school. You know? Well, I think it'll work for old folks, too. But we live in an educated world today. And if, if, you, if, you, if all you can talk about is what you know about Jesus and the Bible, that's powerful and that's good, and it, God will use that. But if you're able to communicate with people in the world today, they will be more apt to give you time and listen to you. Do you all understand what I'm saying? Um... People receive people that are like them, who communicate like them, and who can talk with them on the same level. And it's just a simple fact that your, your education level is identifiable and recognizable to people on the same level. Okay? Now, if you're, if you're a person who has a college education, you will naturally recognize other people and relate to them better who are on a college level. And you'll recognize and identify people who are not on a college level. But if you're not on a college level, if, you have, if, you're, if you're a person who's simply on a lower, like a high school level, for example, you won't recognize that someone has a higher level of education. Uh, you may, but more than likely you won't. Do you understand what I'm saying? You won't identify that their vocabulary is more advanced than yours, that their understanding is broader than yours. You won't recognize that, but they will recognize where you're at. And they feel more comfortable communicating with someone on their level. So what are you saying? I'm not saying there's anything wrong with people who have differing levels of education because the majority of society doesn't even have a bachelor's degree in college, okay? So you guys are already more educated than the majority of society, okay? But what I am saying is, is that you may be limiting yourself in reaching people that you could be reaching. If you just read some more. <laughs> Amen? Okay. Hear me now and believe me later. All right? <laughs> okay. Um, so uh, here's an outline analysis dealing with cults. Cults are everywhere. I don't have to tell you that. Some are mainstream, widely accepted. Uh, it's unfortunate now that most of, most of Christendom looks at Mormonism as a Christian faith now. Uh, you know, uh, I, I hate to say it, and I'm not, I'm not picking on uh, uh, Mick, Mitt Romney, Mitt Romney, but basically, he, you know, him running for president brought Mormonism further into the mainstream and uh, actually, really, they're really accepted as, as a Christian denomination or Christian, uh, a segment of Christianity now. They refer themselves to themselves now as Christian, and they didn't used to do that before. So what are they doing? That's called apologetics. They themselves have always had their own 
branch of apologetics, you know, to win people over, to defend Mormonism. Well, what they've done is, is they've just used an advanced apologetics in the same way that Christianity is doing it. And so now they've taken on the term Christianity so that they can win more. And it's working for them. Mormonism is still one of the top two fastest growing religions in the world. And it's because people, as a general rule, don't know that they're not Christian because the name of their church is Latter-day Saints of Jesus Christ. Most people don't know. Okay. I'm just giving you an example here. So others um, are, are other cults, maybe isolationist. They hide from examination, and, and they do it at great cost sometimes. They're growing and they're flourishing. Some cause great suffering, and others appear to be very helpful and beneficial to the community and society. But whatever the group, the ultimate problem is, is that they're leading people to destruction. They may be benefiting society. Uh, they may be helping a lot of people. They may be raising a lot of money and giving it to hurting children. They may be doing a lot of great hum things for humanity. But ultimately, the focus of Christianity, number one, is to win people to Jesus. Amen. We can go and we can feed all the children in Africa, and we have a, we have a scriptural mandate to do it. But first and foremost... We have a mandate to preach the gospel. Okay? Amen. So we want to ask the question, what is a cult? Generally, it's a group that is unorthodox, uh, stoic, and has a devotion to a person, an object, or a set of new ideas. They usually come out of, with a new teaching. Uh, they have some new th theology or some new doctrine. Uh, it's, an only, it's only a true teaching. In other words, it often considers traditional religious systems to be apostate, and it alone possesses the complete truth. It's like now we have it, and everybody else is missing it now. And if you want to be where God's moving today, here I am. I have it. I've got it. This is where you get it, okay? Uh, they have strong leadership. Often an individual or small powerful leadership group holds control of the group's teachings and practices and you don't challenge them. If you challenge them, you come highly, uh, you come under, you come, I don't remember what I'm trying to say. You, you become highly criticized is what I'm trying to say. You don't criticize that leadership. If you do, you will be overwhelmed with criticism yourself. In other words, you just don't challenge them. Because they're not touchable, is the idea. Uh, as asset acquirement. They often require tithing and property transfer to the religious system. Um, tithing is not a problem because that's a Christian doctrine and principle. But they want you to transfer usually more than that. They usually want you to transfer your property. Sometimes they have other assets and things they want you to transfer. In other words, they go further into it usually than what the Bible requires. They're isolationists usually to facilitate control over the members physically, intellectually, financially, and emotionally. Uh, they don't always move out into a compound like uh, Jim Jones did back, you know, uh, 30 years ago. Uh, or uh, the guy did that moved out into, that's in jail now, wherever they moved, West Texas or wherever that was, uh, that molested all the young ladies. Or David Koresh. They don't always move into a compound like that, but they do isolate themselves. They try to get their people uh, to uh, stay separate from other Christians and from other people because, because what they imply is, is that they'll just confuse you. They'll, um, they won't understand you. Uh, you'll be persecuted because this new truth that we have is so powerful that other people can't comprehend it. Because God's given you a great teacher like me and, you know, we're moving into some deep stuff and you just need to stay close to home. You need to stay close to here so you can get this thing. And they want you isolated. Um, <clears throat> and then a controlling, very controlling. They exercise control over the members. Sometimes this is through fear, threatening loss of salvation. If you leave the group, sometimes it's through indoctrination. Um, they'll, they'll do it in all kinds of ways. They'll tell you if you leave the church, you're going to lose your wife, <laughs> you know, or you're going to lose your family. They're going to all leave you. They'll tell you God has showed me 
that if you leave the church, you're going to get cancer. I mean, they'll, all kinds of stuff. You're going, to, you're going to lose your job. You're going to lose everything you've got. They'll tell you you're going to lose your salvation if you leave this church. Uh, just anything, basically. They'll, they'll do all kinds of stuff. Anything they can do to control you and keep you uh, basically close to them, believing what they believe. Indoctrination, they possess methods to reinforce the cult's beliefs and standards where opposing views are ridiculed and often misrepresented. And these can be anything from subtle things to extreme, wild, and crazy methods. Um, it can be from locking you up somewhere to just, just simply uh, subtle things like, uh, you know, you're, the reason you're confused is because you're, you're entertaining those Christian doctrines down the street. And if you'll stay away from that sister-in-law you got who's, who's, you know, goes to that normal church, you'll be okay. See, mm. they're, they're oftentimes apocalyptic, which means they give the members a future focus and a philosophical purpose in avoiding the apocalypse or being delivered through it. Oh, they may, they may say that we're going to all go and form an encampment and, and we're going to go ahead and start storing up food. And, uh, which if, if you're listening to some of the things I'm saying right now, you can see the Mormons in this. <laughs> you can see Jehovah's Witness in this. Jehovah's Witness are very apocalyptic. Mormons are very apocalyptic. Um, but but they're also both are all they're all very controlling. The Jehovah's Witnesses are very controlling in their in their teaching and training. You have to come to training seminars all the time. You're required to go out and witness. And Mormons, you have to give two years of your life as a missionary uh, before you go to college. Uh, so, you know, in other words, these are very strong, very controlling, and, and their indoctrination is very powerful. And they've got a real strong focus on um, the apocalypse and what might happen. You know, the Mormons always, always have enough food stored up for seven years for their denomination, for their whole vast denomination worldwide. They've got it stored up underground and here and there, and it's just it's a major deal. And then uh, they place a lot of emphasis on experience. Various practices, including meditation, repetition of words, phrases, spiritual enlightenment with God are used as confirmation of their truth. And it's not, it's not that we also believe in experiences, amen? But it's not that the experiences are bad. It's that they place higher, higher value on experiences than they do on the Word of God. And some cults will still use the Bible, like David Koresh preached from the Bible, but he twisted everything and placed higher, experience, higher emphasis on experiences. In other words, what he said carried more weight than the Bible. In other words, what he prophesied, even if it contradicted the Bible, carried more weight than the Bible. And this is often what happens. You know, you, somebody has a vision, and this vision is totally out in left field and doesn't even align with Scripture or the Bible. But in a cult, it's like, that's okay, our prophet has spoken. You know, the Mormons have prophets, and they have prophets today, and they're pro and which... Prophets is fine. You know what I'm saying? There, there are prophets today. But the Mormons have prophets that sit and preside over their whole Mormon faith. And the prophets say things and do things and decree things. And, you know, the, it, it, it was that you, you could... Uh, it, was, it was part of the Mormon faith for 100 years to have uh, multiple wives, you know, polygamy. And then all of a sudden, when the laws got so stringent and the Mormons were getting put in jail and things were getting out of hand, all of a sudden, the prophets all had a new revelation and said, well, maybe we better not do that no more. Hello? Well, so you, you see what I'm saying? Deprivation. Uh, sometimes they will encourage sleep and food deprivation, which weakens the will of the subject. This is uncommon, though practiced uh, in the more severe cults. And sometimes this is in the indoctrination period. When people first come in, they'll, you know, they'll tell them. They call it uh, sometimes fasting periods or, or uh, intercession periods, which sounds fine and good because Christians do both of those things. <laughs> and that's, that's godly to fast and to pray and to intercede. But they do it sometimes in excess uh, without the will of the person really being involved. It's forced upon them. And it weakens them so that it's almost like a military type of a thing where they're just totally, whatever you want to teach me, teach me. You know what I'm saying. And it's intentional. And then there's persecution. 
predictions of being persecuted often combined with claiming any opposing views demonstrated against them as a form of persecution. In other words, anybody that won't believe what, what I'm saying is persecuting me. But they're not persecuting me, saints. They're persecuting you because I am your gift from God. Do you see what they're saying? And, and, and the people, you know, b begin to see these things and believe these things. Uh, many have non-verifiable belief systems. For example, they would teach something that can't be verified. There, there, there's <laughs> like, like a spaceship behind the Hale-Bopp comet. You remember the guys that all killed themselves? Or that God... Uh, an alien or an angel appeared to the leader and gave him a revelation. Or the members are seated angels from another world. And you, you often would wonder, why in the world would people believe nonsense like this? But people are gullible. People are created by God to believe in God and in the supernatural because there is a supernatural world and, and God is a supernatural God. He is a spirit. And so the devil uses this craziness to, to deceive them and draw them into this stuff. Uh, we're going to begin so, uh, by picking up with the leader of a cult. And uh, so often this is a charismatic individual who is uh, considered to be very special for numerous different reasons. Um, some of those being the cult leader has received a special revelation from God, possibly. The cult leader claims to be the incarnation of a deity an angel, or a special messenger. They sometimes claim to be appointed by God for a mission. The cult leader claims to have special abilities. The leader is often above reproach and is not to be denied or contradicted. Usually seeks to do good works. Otherwise, no one would join them, of course, if they didn't have some type of a moral or a positive type of a mantra uh, you know, something that would attract people. They usually are usually moral and possess a good standard of ethical teaching. Many times the Bible is used or additional scriptures are penned. The Bible, when used, is always distorted with private interpretations. Many cults recruit, recruit I'm sorry, Jesus as one of their own and redefine him accordingly. <laughs> <laughs> the guy down in Miami, Florida. You've probably seen him on television. He says he's Jesus. And he's got churches down in South America also. He professes to have thousands and thousands of uh, followers and members. And I saw some video. I've seen it several times on the news and stuff. Video fo footage of his church in Florida. He's got thousands of members. And he's just as charismatic and as ordinary looking as you or me. Um speaks like a typical charismatic or uh, evangelical speaker or preacher. He, everything about him, I mean, you wouldn't think he was any different except he says he's Jesus. And people love him. And the crowd he's got, it looks uh, like it's probably predominantly Hispanic, but of course that is a very strong Hispanic area down there. And he, he has churches down in South America which would be predominantly Hispanic probably or Latino in any sense. And, uh, but, but these look like um, middle to upper class people coming to his church. I mean, nice vehicles, nice dressed, uh, look like they're educated. And you, you know, you wonder, what's the deal here? But people are hungry for something and easily deceived. Cult groups typically vary greatly <clears throat> from the ascetic to uh, the promiscuous, from the historic knowledge to very simple teachings from the rich and powerful to the poor and the weak i remember uh over in washington state oh it's probably been 10 years ago pretty good sized church that uh i mean probably ran a couple thousand to three thousand was was a typical spirit-filled non-denominational type of a charismatic church i want to say that it was actually a pentecostal denominational church but i'm not going to say that because I don't want to blight their name in case I'm re not remembering that correctly. Uh, but uh, the, the, they started out like many of the other churches. You know, the people just would get exuberant and kind of hop up and down, dance and worship a little bit. And it moved from that to um, uh, they would, people would kind of hold hands in church and dance a little bit. Kind of like the Jewish style. You know how they'll do. They'll hold hands and dance in a circle. And they started doing some of that. 
And they all seem to be innocent to begin with. I actually saw some video on this. This is why I know about it and the progression of it in, in a sociology class. And then uh, before you knew it, uh, people were pairing up in, uh, you know, in twos and dancing and then altars. We're talking about several thousand people, you know, in the aisles and not everybody doing it, but pretty much the aisles and the altars were full of people dancing in worship. And before you knew it, um, well, not before you knew it, but over a period of time, this thing had evolved to where they were having um, just uh, worship sessions for couples. And they weren't necessarily for married couples. It was just men and women, though. Now, it was just the opposite sex, and they were dancing in, as couples. And they weren't only dancing to, it was worship songs that they were playing, so it was still, quote, spiritual. But they were dancing as in couples, and, you know, it didn't necessarily, you didn't have to dance with your wife or whatever. And then it evolved from that to what they called close in spiritual encounters. And you can imagine what that turned out to be. Uh, they weren't very spiritual. They were just the opposite. opposite. And this was a large church that eventually uh, went to the point to where it just totally, of course, they got put out of the denomination and uh, I, I don't know what all happened, but it, it, it evolved into a cultic type thing that um, it, it ended up, um, uh, we'll call it uh, fleshly or carnal. You know, crazy how things uh, get twisted and, and go, go nuts, you know, it's just crazy. So who's vulnerable to joining a cult? Well, just about everybody can be. Rich people, poor people, educated people, uneducated people, old, young, previously religious, atheistic people, anybody <coughs> can uh, get caught up in these things. The general profile, however, of a cult me member, uh, some or all of the following characteristics tend to, uh, tend to be present. They become disenchanted with conventional religious establishments. And I have seen this to really be a strong characteristic of people who get into cults. They get tired of what they call religion or the religious system. Uh, usually they haven't gone to the church that they were raised in or the type of church that they were normally worshipped in. They, they, got, they got offended because something happened, you know. They missed, somebody misused money or, or uh, the pastor made a decision they didn't like or there was some gossip going on in the church. And how many of you know no church is perfect? right? Uh, in, in other words, generally it wasn't any really what you would call a grotesque sin that was church-wide. It was just an incident within the church or overall the person themselves just got tired of religion, quote, according to their words. And from that point, you know, they began to fall out of church and it led them down a path that ended up in more trouble. Uh, they're usually intellectually confused over religion and or philosophical issues. Sometimes they're disenchanted with society as a whole. It has, has a, they have a need for encouragement and support usually. Emotionally, they're needful. They need a sense of purpose. Oftentimes, they're financially needful. Um, some of the recruitment techniques that cults will use, they find a need and they fill it. Cults, know that they can they they know that you can build a church if you'll minister to needs um, the churches that feed the hungry the churches that will um, clothe the naked the churches that will do what so many churches these days aren't willing to do are the churches usually that will attract people um, and that particularly that particularly means on a larger scale than just common. Most churches will help out a hungry person. Most churches will clothe, you know, somebody that needs some clothing. In other words, I'm, I, I don't mean that churches don't do that. All churches do that. But I mean they'll do it on a bigger scale. They'll, they'll go to the furthest extent to try to help these people in these areas. One of the ways they do this is called uh, love bombing. <clears throat> and this is uh, constant pos positive affection in word and deed. Sometimes there's a lot of physical contact like hugging, pats on the back, and touching. Uh, the cult group members will lend emotional support to someone in need. They help them in various ways, whatever's needed. The person then becomes indebted to the cult. It's a psychological game is what it is. 
It's, um, it's going that extra mile, not because Jesus said, if they ask for your shirt, give them your coat. They do it intentionally to make the person feel obligated to have to, you know, show up, to have to be participate, a participant in what they're doing. They compliment them, they reassure them, they make them the center of attention. Many cults use the influence of the Bible and they mention Jesus as being one of their own and thereby adding validity to their system. Um, they'll twist Scripture around to, to support whatever their cause is or to support their movement as much as they can. Those that use the Bible take verses out of context, then they mix their misinterpreted verses with their aberrant uh, philosophy, uh, they, they utilize gradualism, they s slowly altering of thinking processes and belief system through repeated teaching. People usually accept cult doctrines one point at a time. New beliefs are reinforced by other cult members. Uh, so what you do is you bring in a new concept. We were, some of us were talking at lunch here right before I went back to eat. And a couple of the ladies that aren't with us here anymore, they, these two ladies that were here had to go. But they asked me what I thought about this new hyper grace teaching. I said, well, first of all, it's not new. And secondly, it's not of God. <laughs> you know, uh, it, grace is of God, amen. But the message of hyper grace that's sweeping our country, actually sweeping the globe right now, the whole thing is a perversion of grace. The idea is, is that you don't have to do anything. God did everything. They don't preach against sin hardly. They don't, they don't preach conviction. Basically, they just preach that everything's about grace, 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 grace. And you have no responsibility and no obligation any, at all. Basically, underlying what they're implying is you can live like you want to, you can do what you want to, and everything's good and copacetic as far as God's concerned. And that's called hyper grace. And unfortunately, <clears throat> there are numerous high-profile ministries preaching this message now. And it is very detrimental and very deceptive. <clears throat> well, I'm going to tell you what. <clears throat> People that are preaching this message are not... Some of them are in mainline denominations. Some of them are mainline leaders of large churches that are, at least were or are reputable ministries. But the message they're preaching is a cultic message. Because what it does is it attracts and draws people to them and it draws people to that message by giving them false assumptions about the gospel and about Christ himself. And all it really does is it builds people around them because it doesn't build people around Jesus. Because basically, why do they need Jesus? God's done everything for them. There, there's no real preaching of repentance or redemption. Everything's about this hyper grace. And it's not a true doctrine. It's not a true true belief and uh but i tell you they'll fight you over it and you'll hear people say things like i've finally been set free okay well you know that's what the alcoholic says when he gets a drink you know oh man i feel free now well the problem is is that he's addicted to something and that's what cultism is it's it's like an addiction when you're addicted to something, you feel oppressed, you feel miserable until you get your fix. And that's what happens to them. They put their emphasis and their faith is in a doctrine that's not a true doctrine. And so when they get their fix, they feel like, oh man, relief, you know. So they run to their cult leader for another fix, so to speak. It's the same with alcoholism. It's the same with any addiction. The only way to break it, you've got to be delivered with, from it from the power, by the power of God. And that's the same with this thing here. Um, and what you'll see is, is that new beliefs are reinforced by other cult members. If you try to question it or question the leader, if you say to someone in that church or surrounding that person leadership that, hey, that's not true, hey, you know, I don't agree with that doctrine, you better look out because they'll pull out their sword and chop your head off. Man, they're going to defend that person and they're going to defend that doctrine. That's how cults operate, um, and that's how they recruit. So why would somebody join a cult like that? Well, the cult satisfies various needs. It satisfies psychological needs. Someone could have a weak personality. So a lot of people are easily led. Uh, people have emotional needs. Someone could have recently suffered an emotional trauma, lost a loved one, a child, a husband, or something of that nature, um, experienced something traumatic in their life. We talked about that in one of our classes, grief and things of that em uh, situation. Uh, intellectually, someone has questions that this group 
seems to be answering. Um, the cult gives them approval, acceptance, purpose, and a sense of belonging. Unfortunately, sometimes we as Christians have had a tendency, and some churches have been more guilty than others, of wanting to try to attract people that were more influential or had money or things of that nature, had teaching gifts or ministry gifts. Maybe we didn't do it intentionally. <coughs> we were just trying to build a church. We were just trying to build the kingdom of God, and we got a little off balance, and we forgot that it's, it's about the hurting and the broken. And we forgot that it's about the poor and the hungry. It's about caring for the people that Jesus loves and cares for, and he loves everybody. And so sometimes those people got neglected. Sometimes we forgot to invite them to take the front seat, amen, instead of the rich guy or the educated guy. And so what happened was is when these cults come to town or come in the neighborhood, they target those people. And they focus on those people. And those people are so hungry for attention and love that they will latch on to anything. And that's where they get hooked. So, um, <clears throat> anyway, so cults are appealing for some reason. And uh, it could be because of moral rigidity and purity. Many times they'll have a lot of rules. And they'll, they'll require people to be very, very pure. Uh, another one is uh, your, your uh, oneness groups, your Jesus name churches. These, uh, they have a very pure doctrine. They have a very moral standard in their dress and in their, in their overall appearance. And you, you guys are familiar with them, I think, and you know what I'm talking about. But the fact of the matter is, is that the um, Jesus name, oneness doctrine is not a correct doctrine. And uh, to be perfectly honest, we try to be nice about it and not push the issue, but it really, it's, it's, it's a false doctrine. And, and it's... It is, and it's cultic. <laughs> and if you can't, if you'll go back and look at the list and the things that we've just been reading, and you and you step back and you look at them, you look at they're they're typically isolated from other people. They have an air about them that they don't want to associate with other people. In other words, I'm not going to go through this whole list of characteristics again, but they fit it to a T. Bless God, I know they love God. I'm not saying that 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 they're not saved. I'm just saying that they've got a doctrine that is way off base. And uh, it's a problem. And that, but that attracts some people. Some people say, you know, if I'm going to uh, serve God, then that's what I'm looking for. This is why Pentecostalism in the last 100 years has been the fastest growing segment of Christianity. is because people have been hungry for a religion that preaches living it. You know what I'm saying? Um, some is a God has been a massive growing movement in the world because all around the world people are looking for a movement that preaches living holy it's not so much that people are looking for a movement that preaches everything that somebody's got preached they want people they want to be a part of something that preaches keeping your life pure living pure how many of you hear what i'm saying and it's not that the other denominations aren't preaching it and don't practice it or believe it. It's just that the assemblies of God are very rigid in it. You know, they're, and I don't mean that word rigid to sound bad. It's just that they just, hey, you know, if you're going to be a member of this church, many of, many of the AG churches still say to be a member, you must sign a piece of a paper saying you will abstain from tobacco. Okay? Most denominations do not require that. Uh, I remember growing up, as a young Baptist boy, and all the deacons standing on the front porch of the church smoking before church. You know? <laughs> I mean, that's what they did, you know? Well, then later in life, when we moved into the Assemblies of God church, I mean, that's sin in the Assemblies of God church. You don't, you don't use tobacco. How many of you hear what I'm saying? So, uh, it's all perspective, but y y so, so it's all about what people like. So, when a cult comes off and says, uh, we're going to be rigid, we're going we're to preach purity, that's attractive to people. That's attractive to people. By the way, I wasn't saying Pentecostalism is cultism. It's not. Okay. Are you, are you following? I didn't communicate that, did I? Okay, good. Okay, good. Financial security. <clears throat> um, financial security is another thing sometimes that uh, will attract people. That a lot of times uh, cults will say, if you'll hook up with us, you know, we're going to help you be financially secure. We're going to teach you certain principles. We're going we're to help you in this area in this way. 
um, promises of exaltation, redemption, higher consciousness, or a host of other crazy rewards. Uh, we're going to teach you how to reach another dimension spiritually that, that you can't get anywhere unless you join us, that type of thing. Um, you're going to become a supernatural person, or you're going to become uh, greater than you've ever been. You won't reach your destiny unless you hook up with us. That's what a cult says, uh, that type of thing. <clears throat> so how do you keep people in a cult? Well, they do it through, number one, dependence. People often want to stay because the cult meets the psychological, intellectual, and spiritual needs. Uh, they also keep them in there through isolation. They, uh, outside contacts are reduced. Contacts are reduced, and more and more of the life of the member is built around the cult. And then it becomes very easy to control and shape the member. The more time you can keep the people consumed around the cult's activities and its programs and events, the less time they can be influenced or pulled away or come to see that what they're a part of is off balance or off base. And so it's intentionally done. The, the fact of the matter is, is that most of the time when you have a cult leader, they're either nuts or they know what they're doing. They're not, you know, themselves that con totally convinced that they're all, they're all that. <laughs> they know that they got a program they're working to deceive people and convince people. And they're totally aware of what they're doing. Or they are totally flipped out like the guy that we talked about earlier, you know, with the comment and everything. That dude, you can look at his eyes and tell he wasn't here. He left a long time before, before that comment came by. <laughs> but anyway, um, <clears throat> cognitive reconstruction or otherwise they call that brainwashing. Once the person is indoctrinated, their thinking processes are reconstructed to be consistent with the cult and to be submissive to its leaders. This facilitates control by the cult leaders. And this is done in a variety of different ways. Um, the, actually, through psychological study and through psychological principles, it's amazing what you can do to a person's mind and to a person's belief systems. And then also, many times, a lot of cults simply just do it through oppressing people. You can oppress someone, and they'll do whatever you want. It's like mistreating a dog. You mistreat a dog, and every time you come around, it'll cower. You know, it'll, 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 it'll lay down, hide its head, or roll over on its back, because it's afraid of you, and it'll go into submission. And a lot of times, this is how cult, cults operate. The minute the leader comes around, or the leaders, the, those in authority come around, the people are so uh, intimidated, so in fear, that they just, basically, they just cower. And they just give in to the, to the pressure, and that type of thing. So, there's different ways that they do this. And then there's substitution. The cult and the cult leaders often take the place of a mother, a father, priest, teacher, or a healer. Often the member takes on the characteristics of a dependent child seeking to win the approval of the leader or the group. Uh, it's similar to mentorship without the true biblical spiritual qualities that are supposed to be there. Bi mentorship is a biblical aspect, but they do it in the sense of making someone codependent on them. And that is not what is desirable of the Lord. That's, an, that's, that's a bad quality. And they do that to people so that the person feels like they can't survive without this individual in their life. Indebtedness. Uh, they, the member becomes indebted to the group emotionally, financially, and otherwise. And whatever they can do to make them feel like, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm trapped here. I can't get out. Uh, I have to pay back this commitment in one way or another. Then there's guilt. The person is told that to leave is to betray the leader, to betray God or the group. The person is told that to leave would mean to reject the love and the help the group has given. And again, this is just simply placing group on some, I mean, guilt on someone makes them feel bad for leaving. Uh, are you going to abandon all your family and friends? The people that have done so much for you? These people that have prayed for you? These people that, that picked you up when you were at your lowest point? And this is how they approach them and they put guilt on them. And that's not right. Uh, and also, sometimes they use threats. Threats of destruction by God for turning from the truth. Sometimes physical threat is used, though often not. Threat of missing the apocalypse or being judged on Judgment Day. In other words, different tactics are used, but it's to, it's to scare people. It's to make them feel guilty, and it's to make them afraid to actually leave. Um, so, how can you get somebody out of a cult? 
The best thing is to try not to let the person get in there in the first place, obviously. But if, you, uh, if you're a Christian, then you can begin by praying. But to get a person out of a cult takes time, energy, and support. Uh, you teach them the truth. You give them a true replacement for the aberrant belief system. You show the cult's group's uh, philosophic inconsistencies. Study the group and learn its history, seeking clues and information. Try to get them physically away from the cult group. Give them the support they need emotionally. Alleviate the threat that if they leave the group, they are doomed or in danger. And generally, don't attack the leader of the group. That has to come later on. And then uh, converts often feel a loyalty and a respect for the founder of the group. So um, you only confront them when needed. And you have to know that <coughs> there's usually plenty, plenty for you to expose and plenty for you if you'll study the background of a cult that you can use to help begin to show them the history of this group and things of that nature. I mean, even the historical cults like Jehovah's Witness. If you study the history of Jehovah's Witness, they are so full, <laughs> so full of, of contradictions and, um, you know, just all kinds of uh, uh, lies and deception. And their own history bears it out. And the history books in society. Same with the Mormons. The Mormons' history is, is just like... It's, it's just terrible, you know. Joseph Smith, the guy was a swindler and a crook. His, his elders, Brigham Young, all these guys. It's just, it's just so much that you can actually point out. The problem that you run into typically, though, is the followers of these people, especially if they were born into Mormonism or born into Jehovah's Witness, they believe that society has long since persecuted their leaders and that these are false historical accounts <laughs> 